Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to all of you to this session on innovating global health, collaborative action where markets fail. Uh, my name is Francesca Colombo. I'm the head of the OECD Health Division, and I will be your moderator today for this uh, next one hour and 15 minutes. And I'm joined today by five very distinguished panelists, which have a lot of expertise to contribute to this topic that we are addressing today. Uh, I will introduce them uh, and allow them to say a few words of introductions, but just to name them, we have Kevin Otterson, who is Professor of Law, and Neil Pike, Scholar in uh, Health and Disability and Law um, at Boston University and the Executive D Director of CARBEX. We have Jay Beer, who is the Executive uh, uh, Director of Access to Medicine uh, Foundations in Amsterdam. We have Pierre Mullien, who is executive director of uh, the Innovative uh, Health uh, Initiatives uh, in Brussels. We have Julie Kerberding, who is executive uh, vice president and chief patient officer at uh, MSD. And we have Hani Kim, who is the executive director of uh, the Right Fund, the excellent name, the uh, research investment for global health uh, uh, technologies. Now, let me just say a few words by way of introduction to this section, which clearly cannot be more timely. In the context of the current pandemic, there is a lot of talks about the entirety for strengthening the resilience of economies, of the innovation model of health systems and of society more broadly. And quite clearly and relevant to this session, um, when we talk about resilience, we need to think of how to do better to both innovate, but also pay for the ability to respond to these, but also to future uh, crises, particularly in the areas of infectious diseases, but this could be also a more broad uh, question. We need also to ensure that the innovations that we have addresses areas of large unmet needs, and also address areas where perhaps com commercial incentives are not by themselves sufficiently large. And we need to do this in ways that ensure that there is equity and health equity for all, including in access to those innovations so that we can preserve also societal well-being. It's very relevant, obviously, for vaccine, where truly we have had lots of innovation in the context of uh, COVID-19, but that historically have been more the poor, a poor cousin of a curative uh, care. And it's very relevant when we look at another slow burning and potential catastrophe, which is antimicrobial resistance, where poor market incentives have really resulted in the drying up of the innovation pipeline and in companies gradually leaving uh, the market. With that, I would like to uh, start and invite uh, our speakers uh, today to first have uh, perhaps their broader perspective in light also of uh, the work that they are doing uh, on what are the key challenges for sustainable innovation and access for health technologies, be them uh, pandemic vaccines or antibiotics or diagnostic, and how does the work that you are doing seek to address that challenge? Maybe Kevin, can I first invite you? Well, thank you, Francesca, and thank you to OECD for inviting me. It's very early in the morning in Boston, but I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm a, a professor of law at Boston University. I've spent the better part of the last two decades looking at what's messed up, what's broken about the market for antibiotics. Um, and I'm also, as you said, the executive director for the past five years of Carbax, which is a nonprofit supporting innovation um, in this preclinical and phase one space. Um, I want you to think about antibiotics just as a, as a wonderful, precious resource, um, something that I think we take too much for granted. You know, the most valuable in terms of positive impact on human life, probably the most valuable class of drugs ever discovered. Uh, but unlike almost any other class of drugs, this is one we have to constantly renew innovation just to avoid falling behind, you know, because of bacterial evolution because of resistance. We have to keep innovating just to, to stay where we are, um, just to not take this class of drugs and, and waste them and ruin them. Um, think about, um, you know, close your eyes and think about the most beautiful lake you've ever been to, maybe on a summer vacation. And think of that lake as, as filled with just amazing fish. Um, you know, 
if you let everyone just take all the fish out of that lake, you could destroy it. If you let everyone put pollution into the lake, you could destroy it. A resource like that, a lake with valuable fish in it and something that's beautiful, requires some coordination in order to manage it. In the language of economics, we call this a, a common pool resource. Um, and for this case, a global common pool resource. I think of antibiotics and the effectiveness of antibiotics as being in this category. Now, normally we rely on markets to, to try to resolve many of the issues in our world, buyers and sellers, but um, we're buying the wrong thing when it comes to antibiotics. And it's difficult for markets to work effectively when you have a common pool resource. Um, I give you uh, an example um, of how we're buying the wrong thing. Um, my house, uh, you know, years ago, uh, I got a call saying my house was on fire. My wife and daughter went inside, uh, I rushed home, uh, got there in time to see the, the fire brigade, the fire department in Chicago, um, putting out the fire. It destroyed the house next door to us, but, but my house only had modest damage. My wife and daughter were fine. Um, that was not the moment for me to decide whether or not to, to spend money on on training fire departments or training the, the, the people who, who serve them or building the, the pipe system or the truck system or, you know, all of that infrastructure was there when it was needed. But with antibiotics, it's, it's almost as if we're paying on a per fire basis. We're not paying for their value as amazing infrastructure, uh, as being available, um, you know, as this common pool resource that requires replenishment. And if, if we pay on a per fire basis for antibiotics, we, we end up in the situation that we have now, which we're underpaying in the moment, but uh, you know, we're, we're paying the, the market price in the moment, but really underinvesting uh, over the entire span of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the planet and, and as the years go on. So I think we obviously need innovation in this space. Carbex is all about innovation here. We, um, we also need stewardship and access on a global basis. Carbex requires those can, in every contract that we sign to give grants to companies. And the way I think to do this on a global scale to pay for antibiotics differently is this concept called delinkage or subscription. Not paying for the, for the volume, for the number of pills, not paying on a per fire basis, but instead paying based on the value to society this is something that the United Kingdom um, in, in NICE is already doing for two drugs. Something the United States is thinking about doing in the Pasteur Act, and also the European Commission is considering it in, uh, in a program that should um, begin next year to study this issue. So a lot of good work on, underway. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to you, Francesca. Great, thank you, Kevin, for highlighting the common pool resources, this way of thinking and perhaps considering different ways of uh, paying for these uh, common pool resources. We'll probably go into that uh, into the next uh, uh, discussion as well. But before then, uh, Jay, can I invite you to have your perspective on this uh, broad uh, question and also say how your organization is, uh, is addressing it? Over to you. Sure, thanks Francesca, and uh, thank you to the OECD team for having me here. So I lead the Access to Medicine Foundation. Uh, we're an independent uh, nonprofit organization based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And for about 15 years, we've been working uh, to stimulate and guide the pharmaceutical industry to do more to um, improve access to healthcare for people living in low and middle income countries. And these countries are home to 83% of the world population. I think that puts things in perspective. Um, we, I think, um, understand that in our, our, at the moment, innovating and improving access for essential medicines, vaccines, and other health products, uh, including diagnostics, requires a lot of collaboration and a level of ingenuity between a variety of partners. And the most critical stakeholder at the table is um, the patient, the people who need to be at the center, not only in words, but already also in actions. And the other is the pharmaceutical industry. And one of the reasons why we work with the pharmaceutical industry is we, uh, because we believe that their actions um, early in the, in the value chain have a radical downstream impact on people's lives as they develop and produce products that are sometimes only in their hands. And, uh, and these products can be extremely beneficial for millions and billions of people, depending on which product we're talking about. Um, but the pharmaceutical market faces a number of challenges and barriers to sustainable product innovation and access for these essential health goods uh, in that sense. 
Um, I think I can limit it down to about three main uh, challenges and barriers um, that affect many different areas. Uh, some of the areas that Kevin has just spoken about with the antibiotic market. Um, the first is market dynamics and market failure in many different areas. We've seen this with neglect to tropical diseases. Uh, we see this with antibiotics as Kevin has nicely illustrated. Uh, but you also see that uh, generally for, for most medicines, uh, vaccines and diagnostics. Uh, the second is behavior of companies and their investors. Um, at the end of it, not many. Uh, there's only a small pool of, of companies carrying the heavy burden of uh, global health issues. And we definitely need to see a more diverse group of them getting uh, on board and being at the table uh, to solve problems. And the third is inadequate investment of health uh, in many countries, a lack of effective coordination and collaboration. And all of these three factors combine uh, affect that equitable access uh, at the end of it. It becomes more of a blame game with those waiting to change uh, um, uh, before acting, uh, leaning back and, and sitting back before um, uh, while waiting for the market to be uh, to be fixed or for funding to come in. And those willing to take risks and try to solve issues globally make a bigger positive impact on patients' lives than others in that sense. Um, and we've seen this in, in a few different examples. So if I can take a couple of examples here. Um, in pandemic vaccines, we've seen multiple infectious diseases emerge, uh, causing damaging consequences on human health, society, um, uh, poverty rates, uh, I, I think have now also been soaring uh, based on the COVID-19 pandemic. And without the reliable funding and security on financial returns, you know, uh, companies, whether they're pharmaceutical or diagnostic in nature, see little incentive to enter the market of pandemic vaccines. So, and at the same time, so as, as society, we need a robust R&D pipeline uh, within the pharmaceutical in industry, which is critical to address existing and emerging threats and, and be able to step in when a new threat is, is at the table. And um, our work has shown that, that uh, while there has been recent progress in increasing the R&D pipeline for priority conditions that have been identified by the WHO, um, the R&D pipeline remains quite empty for so many pathogens. So there are big gaps when it comes to um, uh, solving some of the major issues. And out of 20 of the biggest pharmaceutical companies assessed uh, in one of our uh, publications called the Access to Medicine Index, we see empty pipelines for 10 of the 16 emerging infectious diseases that have been identified by WHO and other organizations. And I think we have to appreciate that in areas such as infectious diseases, uh, there's a very small concentrated market with uh, only a few um, pharmaceutical companies and also only a few key donors who are really uh, putting money on the table to help some of the mechanisms that, that we've been speaking about. Uh, diagnostics is also a major issue. There's limited health infrastructure. Um, new diagnostics are often not compatible with uh, local environments. Uh, there are issues of affordability and supply chain um, to make sure that patients actually can benefit uh, from the antibio uh, from the uh, diagnostics. And Kevin's already spoken about the various different issues in antibiotics, the broken market, uh, lack of investments, a shrinking market, and uh, the lack of, of policy itself. So one of the ways that we've tried to, um, to solve the problem is uh, we use our independence to, to convene and, and, and bring um, organizations together. We also use our independence to, um, to ensure that there is a multi-stakeholder consensus on the key role and what good looks like uh, for companies to, to play that role. Um, and we use a combination of progress reporting, uh, best practices, and a system that engages influential players like the industry themselves using town halls and, and empowering the internal change makers within companies. And we try to leverage um, uh, organizations that don't typically talk about access, uh, for example, institutional in investors. So we currently work with over 150 institutional investors who manage assets of about 25 trillion US dollars, and they use the, the insights and analyses to better manage the risks and opportunities uh, for pharmaceutical companies and um, inform direct engagements with uh, investee companies in that sense. And in the next five years, we've identified a number of different um, segments to, to work into big generics, vaccines, uh, medical oxygen, diagnostics, and, and, and try to create change there and make sure that we also uh, play a role in, in uh, building the right frameworks for investment and uh, policy um, uh, improvements at the government level. Over. Right, Jake, thank you so much. You cover a lot of grounds, but you know, so you highlighted how you work in this uh, softer way, but also through the trying the collaboration with, uh, uh, with different actors to really encourage change. Uh, we'll be delighted to hear more in the discussions, but let me first uh, go to Pierre Melian for the Executive Director of uh, Innovative Health Initiative in Brussels. 
Um, Chiara, over to you. What's your uh, perspective and what does your um, uh, institution does? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francesca, and uh, thank you to the OECD for inviting me too on this uh, great panel. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, so the Innovative Health uh, Initiative is the next phase uh, of the Innovative Medicines Initiative. Uh, and um, it, the, the, the big difference is that it's much more cross-sector. Uh, as you know, IMI was um, uh, very much a, a, a joint venture between the European Commission and the European pharmaceutical industry. And IHI is going to be a joint venture between the European Commission and Pharma MedTech uh, uh, Metech Europe, Cossier, who look after the high instrument makers, the uh, imaging, digital, and so on and so forth, and uh, Europa Bio looking after the, uh, the biotechnology sector. So uh, we're going to take advantage of the uh, technology convergence that's going on between all these sectors, um, and they need to be de-siloed uh, in order to, uh, to uh, go forward. We'll use the same model of building large uh, consortia uh, that are uh, highly networked and involve everyone uh, uh, that is needed to uh, accelerate um, uh, uh, development, innovation, and, and, and so on. So uh, when I say everyone, so not only do we have the, 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 the great researchers, uh, the great clinicians, and the great uh, industry players, but also, and very importantly, uh, patients uh, at the center of everything we do, uh, public health uh, bodies, payers, uh, the regulators, and, and so on and so forth. So we build these uh, networked uh, consortia. Uh, normally, we, uh, uh, we uh, work in a pre-competitive mode so that we focus on things uh, that either are uh, market failures uh, uh, like AMR uh, that Kevin has, uh, has uh, talked about, but also looking at other gaps in ecosystems where uh, pre-competitive um, uh, plays, uh, public, par public private partnerships can, can build value. And these can be uh, pieces of infrastructure. So in, in AMR, we have built a very large uh, clinical trial infrastructure in Europe involving a thousand hospitals um, with associated uh, labor clinical laboratories. Um, we have uh, built uh, a lot in uh, uh, around Ebola, um, and uh, that that was other. There was no never going to be a market for Ebola, but a lot of that work has gone into the COVID. Uh, 19 vaccine uh, developments and certain technology platforms. And uh, of course, COVID, uh, vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine is not a market failure. <laughs> it's uh, a very uh, successful uh, uh, market uh, uh, product uh, that obeys a very uh, similar um, rules to normal uh, uh, pharmaceutical or vaccine product development. Uh, the issues there have been access in uh, developing countries, and um, there we've we've seen the uh, the for obvious political reasons uh, the uh, devel developed countries uh, ensuring that their populations are uh, are uh, securely vaccinated um, before uh, anything is done elsewhere, and this is the big problem for how do we get equitable access uh, for uh, products in, in that way. And that, that problem has, has uh, not been solved and um, uh, needs to be addressed at a, at a global level, obviously. So um, we have uh, in, our, in our own uh, backyard, we have kind of sweet spots for public-private partnerships. And these are, of course, market failures, but are, there are also infrastructure plays. We've done a lot in uh, pediatric uh, clinical trial infrastructure, uh, and we've done a, a lot in um, neurodegenerative diseases where uh, this is another uh, big, uh, more of a scientific issue than, than any other issue, but where um, public-private come together and where uh, normally competing uh, industry players are willing to, um, to uh, uh, work together, collaborate together, partnership partner together, share data in order to accelerate uh, knowledge. 
So uh, I think uh, the the one of the big uh, issues here, of course, is uh, how we maintain sustainability of some of these big pieces of infrastructure. Uh, we're uh, quite lucky in Europe that we have a very significant resources, not only coming from our own organization, but uh, from the uh, European countries through the European, European Commission. And we have a sustainability plan now for uh, the, that big clinical trial infrastructure through an organization that's called ECRAID, uh, funded in part by the European Commission. And so, but we need to find sustainability platforms for many, many of these uh, big infrastructures that we're, that we're creating. So I'm going to, I'll pause there, uh, Francesca, and uh, uh, put it back to you, and, and then we'll enjoy uh, contributing to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Pierre, for putting on the table the various possible collaborative uh, uh, platforms as well, and the need for sustainability platforms. Uh, may I now go to the private sector, to uh, Pharma, to uh, Julie? To offer your perspective, you know what uh, what is your, your role and what are, from your perspective, the key challenges to sustainable innovation. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a really a great pleasure to participate in this conversation. This is so important. But when I'm thinking a lot about the challenge of bringing innovation and access, it occurred to me that we probably need to deconstruct the concept of access a bit further because we use that term in so many different ways and it means so many different things to many people. Uh, I think of it really in three bra brackets and they're probably all relevant to this conversation. First is actualization. In other words, does the innovation, the product, the vaccine, the antibiotic, does it exist? Um, in the case of antibiotics, one piece of the problem is that the science is lagging in identifying new targets and new approaches to antimicrobial uh, innovation and development. Uh, in other cases, it's lack of investment and failure to really prioritize those investments to drive the science forward. The second bracket of access really is availability. And of course that's complicated. Uh, availability is dependent on approval, is dependent on allocation of available uh, supply. It's dependent on affordability in any given market. And that in turn really, I think calls for regulatory innovation, for policy innovation, and in, in many cases for financial innovation in terms of how products are paid for, procured, stockpiled, et cetera, et cetera. Then the third bucket of access is acceptability and uptake. This is an area that probably gets the least attention, but in some ways it really is the most important for really making the value of the innovations available to the people who need them the most. And we're certainly experiencing that right now in the context of the pandemic, that trust in the product and the systems to actually deliver the innovation into the arms or the mouths of the people who need it um, is just as important in thinking about access as the actual um, innovation and discovery of new products and, and their clinical development. So uh, when I think about that from an MSD hat, this concept of access, and then how are we approaching it as a company? Um, there are several traditional approaches that we've taken, but there are also some that I think are more experimental or more innovative. Um, from the traditional standpoint, clearly uh, from a global health perspective, donation has been a tried and true methodology, Merck's Mectazen donation program, which has resulted in the elimination of filariasis and river blindness in many countries around the world is a longstanding exemplar of that. But that's a, a pattern that many companies and, and many in the private sector continue to support in private public um, partnerships because you have to um, get not just the donation, but you have to once again um, achieve uptake. I think um, there's also the um, emergency response. We've seen that happen at least 830 times since COVID started, 830 products have entered various stages of clinical development, whether they're vaccines, immunologics, diagnostics, et cetera. So people do step up in an emergency and go above and beyond. Uh, we experienced that at Merck with the development of Herbivo, the uh, Ebola vaccine, 
And I think um, that led us to some rude awakenings about the sustainability of that effort and what happens after you've created enough vaccine to solve the problem in the short run, you essentially have a market failure again and no uh, capacity to maintain that manufacturing. But then you get into um, a third area that is more experimental and that's um, really the area of innovative finance. Um, we've seen IMI, a fantastic um, experimental test bed for a variety of approaches and, and uh, I, I, sorry to say IHI now, sorry, Pierre, um, but there are other things in play. For example, Merck is the party to the AMR fund, which is a billion dollar investment in trying to drive innovation and the pipeline for um, new anti-infectives that need to be a counterparty with uh, policy innovation to try and correct some of the market failures that would preclude the sustainability of that effort. But I could mention several innovative financing mes methods be besides the delinking methodology for AMR and the Pasteur Act. But I, I, I wanna bring forward one final um, piece of this because I think um, in a sense, we're expecting an awful lot of the innovation en engine as the solution to the incredible health disparities we see around the world. And it is asking a lot for medicines and vaccines to solve the problem of health equity if we don't simultaneously look for innovation and in health system delivery. There's no silver lining in COVID, but at least it demonstrated that there were novel ways to deliver health services with less uh, expense and much innovation to come in that space that could sort of leapfrog, especially in the developed world to provide better access to care, not just better access to products, but better access to systems of healthcare. And I'd like to spend a lot more time concentrating on that because I think that ultimately is a much broader and sustainable solution to the health inequities that we face. So I'll stop there and look forward to the other com conversation. Right, Julie, thank you so much for bringing also the health system perspective. I could not agree more, of course, that uh, there are immense uh, challenges and uh, also failures in terms of making sure that uh, access uh, um, you know, involves uh, changing the, the health system and the delivery systems, and uh, that it's a, a very important part of, uh, of the picture. Uh, may I now go to Hani, Hani Kim, uh, to really provide a perspective on what are the, some of the key challenges on, uh, to sustainable innovation, but also to access for health technologies, and how is uh, your institutions, uh, your organization addressing those uh, issues? Thank you, Francesca, and I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this panel discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. So to respond to your question, Francesca, I think I reflect that question on a little bit more foundational level. And in my view, fundamentally, the challenges relate to the fact that the resources that are necessary to conduct research and to support development of essential health technologies are highly concentrated within a handful of wealthy nations around the world. That in turn means that the actual capabilities for generating those essential health tools and the tools themselves are highly concentrated within the high income countries. So starting from that recognition, what do we do about it at the right fund? So just a few words about what we are. We are relatively new, we are only three years old. We are a Korean nonprofit funding organization supported primarily by the Korean Ministry of Health. And our second major funding partner is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, our third group of sponsors is nine Korean life science companies. The way in which we, the Right Fund, strives to tackle at least some of these challenges really focus on four aspects, product, collaboration, access, and training. So first, product. We fund projects that aim to develop vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics that may not have market incentives, but have demonstrable unmet health needs globally outside Korea, especially in low and middle income countries. Second, access. So through an instrument 
uh, that we've um, adapted from what's been used at the Gates Foundation, global access. All of our grant agreements require a commitment from our grantees to grant uh, a non-exclusive royalty-free license to IP rights of all our funded technologies. And secondly, to establish a pricing uh, structure to ensure that all the funded technologies are made available uh, or uh, affordable. They're available with affordable uh, price tags for public procurement for the governments in the low and middle income countries. The third bit relates to training. This one I'm particularly excited about because this may be our uh, newest funding scope. We are actively exploring ways to expand our funding scope to support training both Korean and uh, LMIC, the low and middle income country personnel in vaccine manufacturing. This is intended to leverage a large scale investment by the, by the Korean government led by the Korean health ministry to support personnel training in vaccine manufacturing. The last but not least is um, collaboration. We really want to put collaboration at the front and center of all of our funded activities, whether it's for developing tools or generating evidence to identify health problems or for articulating solutions that are tailored to specific local contexts or training. We would, would like to support the Korean researchers to become better at reaching out and collaborating outside Korea with partners around the world, especially those from the LMICs. As I mentioned, we are only three years old, so we have a long way to go, but at least that's where we are headed. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much to all of you. This is a lot of uh, food for thoughts. Maybe we can uh, go into the discussion. Clearly the issues that you raised are very varied. There are issues of, in some cases, market failure, not having the incentives for industry, so not having enough uh, players, issues about uh, having sufficient financing and not just from uh, a small group of uh, countries, but then also issues more related to access to uh, pay more models and, and support. And I wonder maybe if we can uh, go into some of the possible uh, solutions to uh, addressing this, uh, this issue. If we start uh, looking, for example, at uh, market failures uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of product developments and in terms of having enough incentives, uh, Kevin, you alluded to uh, antimicrobial resistance and the issues of having a more delinked model as a possible uh, more innovative uh, solutions. Uh, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit uh, more on those. And is this just a solution for uh, antimicrobial or also for possible other areas of unmet needs? Um, you know, I, I think uh, when I describe it as a global chemical resource, you know, you can also think of it like climate change, you know, something that we all need to work together to preserve the, you know, to keep CO2 levels uh, from exceeding uh, historic limits and therefore, you know, causing warming on the earth. It requires some cooperation and requires some technical understanding and obviously a lot of money. For, for antibiotics or antimicrobials a little more broadly, um, we, we understand the intervention that we need. You know, we, we need new classes and, and new drugs and then to use them carefully and to make sure that they're accessible to people around the world. And the amount of money that's required to actually achieve this is, is completely achievable. You know, the Pastor Act uh, for over a decade would spend $11 billion. Our recent work I've published said that if the rest of the wealthy world, if the rest of the G7 or G20 uh, jumped in and did their fair share, that we essentially have this problem licked on a global basis, that innovation could be paid for from from these countries and then through contractual provisions, stewardship and access, um, you know, supported uh, globally. So, um, you know, it's nice to have a problem that we could solve on a global level with um, just really a couple of billion dollars per year. Um, and, and that to me is encouraging. 
uh, since we're also facing on this planet all sorts of problems that are much larger and much more complex, uh, let's get this one done <laughs> and move on to the things that are, that are actually more difficult. Great, thanks. And I, I wonder if uh, from the perspective of the other uh, panelists, do you see particularly new innovative or um, promising business models which are also emerging in addressing unmet needs in some of the areas that you have uh, alluded to? I wonder if uh, any of you want to, to give their perspective on this. Yeah, I can start. Um, I think we've seen a couple of examples, uh, at least coming from the industry and, and some of the, um, of the investments that are coming uh, to, to support these uh, situations. I mean, in the last few years, I think we've definitely seen that uh, extremely risky areas have had uh, a significant amount of investment coming from, from different uh, governments and, and donors. And as, Han, and as Hani mentioned, uh, a lot of that donors uh, um, has been really in from coming from uh, high income countries. So the innovation is uh, directly coming from many different uh, a, a group of small countries in that sense, right? So, uh, but we've seen a couple of examples where companies are taking uh, more risks in um, uh, potentially involving lowering of prices, um, but going towards a volume-based uh, approach to improve access. Um, and you see now um, companies are also looking at uh, lowering the cost of production by working earlier on in joint ventures and partnerships with uh, manufacturers in, in low-income countries. Uh, you see more usage of uh, non-exclusive uh, voluntary licensing and other non-exclusive uh, technology transfer deals uh, that ensure that products are made in more regions by more manufacturers. So at least you have the security of supply in, in, in different forms. And I think quite interestingly, we saw a few examples. These are quite um, early stage examples of uh, more uh, models where local stakeholders own the solutions. Um, and, uh, and that's only given if the products are affordable and uh, savings set up uh, made uh, are reinvested into the system or passed down to local healthcare providers so that they are able to function and own the particular problem. Um, and I think the other area where we've seen a lot of change is, um, you know, for we've been talking about uh, making sure that more companies are looking at uh, access planning so that uh, you don't have the problem that you have today where um, products are not reaching patients uh, around the world. Um, if you link, think of the statistics about um, uh, any product that has actually been in the market for the last five years, even the new products that are highly effective, reach about 10% of uh, treatment eligible patients in, in high income countries and less than 1% in low income countries. Um, and many of that is really at the private, sec uh, the private market itself. So um, when I joined the foundation in 2013, there was not a single uh, pharmaceutical company uh, that was really looking at access planning to ensure that their products were really um, by nature um, uh, prioritized uh, to, to low income countries or countries where the, the demand is, is, is uh, high and the risk is also very high. Uh, but today, I think um, uh, Novartis was one of the first few to, to make that, um, that change. And now about eight out of the 20 pharmaceutical companies have a system in place and are uh, getting more serious about solving that inequity problem. So there are definitely change uh, happening, but a lot of the times the companies rely on product development partnerships or mechanisms as what Kevin was speaking about in order to engage uh, on these high risk issues. And when those mechanisms are not available, it becomes harder to, um, uh, to ensure that, that global equitable access. Um, for their particular products. And when you do have the products in the market, um, you of course need to keep that sustainable over a number of years and there's very little financing uh, uh, available for that, over. Yeah, thank you. And Julie, there is also a question in the, in, the, in the chat that I see more related to any lessons from the uh, Ebola vaccine uh, experience uh, as well, are there any commonalities? Uh, with previous uh, initiative addressing the needs of uh, communities living in rural areas in low income countries. Is there anything that we can say on that in terms of the possible solutions and innovation models? I may say something on that topic, given our experience in um, doing clinical studies under extreme circumstances of the West African outbreak and then deploying the vaccine under equally, if not even more extreme circumstances in the Eastern DRC. Um, you know, what, one of the important lessons learned in that context really was the power of partnerships. Is, uh, without going into the details, Ebola was first, the vaccine was first uh, 
discovery in, initiated by the Public Health Canada in conjunction with their Department of Defense, supported then by the U.S. Department of Defense, then a small biotech company in Iowa, then Merck stepped in to try to broaden the engagement. So already you see the ecosystem in play. And then beyond that, the incredible partnerships with governments, with nonprofit organizations, with MSF, um, just the, the entirety of what it took to study and get the drug approved, but ultimately um, what it means to deploy and utilize it. So private-public partnerships were critical. Having said all that, from the standpoint of the company that now has made the commitment to fulfill the Gavi stockpile for Ebola vaccine, um, that's great. And we never expected to, um, certainly it's not a profit model, but in addition, um, we know that we're never really going to recover the kind of unintended consequences of our investment, the things that we had to slow down, the investments we had to make to divert manufacturing capacity to this emergency use, which uh, we did, uh, because I think that's part of our moral covenant and our responsibility, but how do we sustain that when there's no more demand for the Ebola vaccine beyond what's committed to the stockpile? So when we think about market failures, it isn't just kind of the ongoing sustainability of, of affordability and, and availability in a given country over a long arc of time. We also have to deal with the failures in these sort of emergency use. So I think the concept of CEPI is a huge innovation there um, to uh, make sure that we have the development of the products that we need for emergency use. But I don't think that we fully solved the problem of how do we then sustain the ability to make the supply. And that's an area where some of the lessons learned from COVID I think are going to come home to roost in a very healthy and constructive way. Great, thank you so much. I wonder if uh, Hani um, and Pierre also have their perspective on that. In terms of promising models and approaches, obviously you talked a lot about also public-private partnership models. Uh, I wonder also in terms of more anticipatory approaches that really help us deliver technology perhaps that we will need in the future, even if we don't know what that future will be. You know, we need to keep on developing uh, new approaches that allow us to have the innovations uh, that will, uh, uh, or at least to invest in the research and development that will put us in a better situation when we'll have a health uh, emergencies coming up. Um, I wonder if you want to add something to these uh, things, like what new approaches have you, have you seen? What uh, policies might be useful? If I, if I may just say a few things, I mean, Francesca, I don't know if what we need more of are necessarily new approaches. Uh, and of course, we, we, welcome, we always welcome um, creativity in thinking of new ideas. But what I'm wondering is, given that we actually already have a few proven instruments, I mean, I've mentioned global access as just one example. Um, I wonder if it would be worthwhile to kind of review what different approaches have worked so far and emphasize rather than adding more approaches mm -hmm. to that list, identifying the key ingredients to really materializing those, to, act, to executing uh, those instruments successfully. And in my experience of or having worked both at a funding organization. I mean, I'm relatively new at the right fund, but I spent about six years at the Gates Foundation. And prior to that, I spent about nine years on the other side as an academic grantee, as a research scientist in translational space. I think uh, among the, uh, the key ingredients for successful collaboration uh, to ensure access, especially when there are intersectoral partners involved, is really to have uh, that commitment to a shared goal right from the beginning with transparency. So it just sounds almost deceptively simple. This is not like a shockingly new idea at all. But I do think that it takes something so boring like that and just make that happen rather than coming up with necessarily more new approaches per se. Uh, you know, how do we actually start out with a project with a firm commitment? that at the end of this project, we want to make sure that there is a pricing strategy 
that will make it affordable to a certain list of countries? How do you make that happen? So that our manufacturing partners will be able to uh, sustain the security supply, I mean, supply security in the long term. Um, so that's sort of what I reflect on a lot these days. I mean, do we necessarily, um, is it the lack of approaches that we um, are confronted with? Or is it lack of commitment or core values that we really have to gather around with? No, I get uh, I get your point, and and, and Pierre, it would be useful to have your perspective. I, I uh, mentioned also there is a question for you, so I don't know if you want us to address it, which has to do again with antibiotics uh, and whether, given the difficulties that companies uh, might have, uh, really to uh, uh, then bring it to market, should we think about uh, different uh, approaches such as transferable exclusivity extensions as well. Um, so I, uh, I don't know whether it's too much for you, but you know, it's, uh, I want it's to bring to your attention that this question was directly directed to you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. And, uh, I, and I was going to uh, start my, my comments by coming back on this uh, risk uh, management uh, piece, because for me, it, it's all to do with um, reducing risk for the, the players, right? And so if... Um, uh, if uh, so it's it's easy to do on the front end well easy it's easier to do on the front end and it's very challenging on the back end so on the front end and that's where uh, ihi is uh, and imi have, have been um uh in 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 this area much much more than uh than uh on the on the back end where the 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 incentives for uh, people to come together and reduce risk for everyone, uh, picking topics like AMR and Ebola vaccine and, and, and other, other things of great public health uh, interest, uh, that's been, I think, quite successful in, in, in using uh, the model of uh, pre-competitive uh, R&D in public-private partnerships. What's been much more challenging has been, and uh, Kevin has already alluded to this, has been to getting the commitments on the back end in terms of the pull mechanisms that we need to ensure that uh, companies go, don't go uh, bankrupt. And uh, we, we need a collective play in, in, this, uh, in this area. Now that's... Uh, it's, it's, it's challenging to do because as you know, um, governments, and, and this is part of uh, human nature, I think, uh, they, they react to uh, big catastrophic issues like pandemics. And we've seen, we've seen that, we've seen everybody coming together for COVID, right? We've seen huge amounts of collaboration, governments, public sector, private sector, uh, and um, with the with the results that we have, which are not perfect, but uh, but at least there was a massive response. Where we don't see that massive response uh, in AMR yet, uh, and are we going to wait for a, a catastrophic event in order to do that, or have we not learned from the COVID uh, pandemic that if you're better prepared? Uh, you don't have this uh, big uh, trillion dollar bills at the end of the day. And as Kevin was saying, you know, with um, relatively modest uh, preparatory uh, investments, uh, one hopefully can be prepared for uh, these next uh, catastrophic events. Uh, so I think for, you know, from the, from the push mechanisms and the, and the R&D push, I think we can find ways of, uh, of, of, of doing this. From the pool point of view, I think we have this, um, this big gap that we need to uh, properly understand. And then I think as, as Hani was saying, really to try and um, get this collective alignment uh, up front uh, for, these, uh, for these issues. Uh, easy to say and not yeah. not very not very easy to do. Uh, I have to say. 
Yeah, great. And I, and I think, yes, the collective alignment I mean, is a matter of uh, setting the incentives uh, differently. You know, how do we mobilize uh, the attention in moments in which it's not the crisis? I think that's the big question. So there was a, a, a and further questions a bit earlier on, and I don't want to forget that as well, which is more about the role of venture capital and private investors in addressing global health uh, challenges. And I know this is a little bit different from what we had been addressing, but I wonder if any of you would like to take these questions about the role of uh, venture capital. Just looking. Uh, let's say briefly, uh, at Carvex, we have the privilege of working with very small companies all over the world that are developing products. And many of them uh, either have some venture funding or are desperately seeking it. And what the, what the funders want to see is what's the commercial model? You know, how, how, are, how are these going to be sold? What's the payout? And um, the thing that I'd like about pull incentives like Pasteur or the UK model or the, the plan that will be proposed in Europe for the commission next year, what I like about it is that it, it reduces the commercial risk. You know, it, it sets at least a floor at which um, investment can then flow in because they know that we'll do no worse than this if we achieve technically uh, what we need to do. And um, so right now, I think a lot of those funders are looking and they're being quite rational, quite hard nosed about it. And what they need to see is some potential commercial return. Um, a pull incentive actually can achieve that without forcing the companies to drive large volumes of sales. Because what we want is to save these drugs, but we still also want them to be available. And uh, that's why a, a subscription or a delinked uh, sort of proposal of pull incentive in that fashion is useful. There was another question in the chat that was also similar. And just to say it again, you know, the commission in, in Europe is looking at this issue. Uh, and next year will be a major study that will be undertaken. I think an, an announcement should be made in January on which group will lead that, that work. Um, but it's a, it's a serious effort that's being looked at um, as pull incentives in Europe, and including transferable exclusivity as well as many other options. I, I would just like to add to that because I, I completely agree in a sense with antibiotics, it's a Goldilocks problem. We want them used enough, but not too much. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a, a very difficult challenge and the market is never going to work very well in that situation. So these kinds of mechanisms are important. But I also wanted to bring up the issue of social impact investing. And I'm not just speaking about sustainability bonds or um, the kinds of things that are sort of the conversation of big investors right now, but rather the focused investments that are going on to try to, for example, strengthen health systems. Uh, at MSD, we have a, a small fund um, in our um, CSR organization. That we're investing about $50 million in a variety of funds that are supporting um, the development of health systems in the resource um, deep, uh, least developed areas of the world. And I think, well, that doesn't specifically target antibiotic development per se. It's a different kind of capital deployment because it builds a sustainable system of quality of care, a system that would have parameters around the appropriate use of antimicrobials, for example. So we have to think about deploying capital, not just in the uh, traditional drug development category, but in the systems that surround that so that when we do come up with innovation, we can use it for a long enough period of time to make it actually worth all of this time and effort that's gone into it and not um, the old, uh, paradigm in anti-infectives, basically, if you use it, you lose it because of the rapid uh, emergence of another brand of resistance. So I, I think when we think about capital, we should think about it very broadly. All right, thank you. I wanted to move uh, in the next group of uh, questions, more looking perhaps at some of the learning from uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And you have already alluded to many of those, but there are obviously issues about uh, to what extent COVID-19 is a trigger for change, for doing things differently. How do you see the future of cost if you want COVID-19? Uh, are we able now to put more on the agenda infectious diseases, but also do we need to think about more pre-negotiated platforms and models that move away for market-driven approaches and perhaps even moving away speaking about access from bilateral deals between 
uh, countries and, uh, and uh, uh, individual companies. And so do we need to think at uh, um, products like vaccines or even antibiotics or diagnostics to be provided as a global public goods? Um, there's quite a lot of uh, questions that are really very much uh, high on, on the agenda stimulated by COVID-19. I wonder if we can, uh, to have your perspective uh, on those, maybe I'll ask each of you briefly to comment, uh, starting maybe with uh, um, Annie. Uh, honey, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, Francesca, could you just repeat exactly which question? Sorry, I think. I, I More general, you're looking at the COVID-19 uh, experience uh, and so, you know, do you think that's a trigger from change from your own perspective? And how do you see the future post-COVID? Um, I mentioned a number of areas, but do pick up the one that is more relevant for you. Yeah. Um, can it, it, it can be a trigger for change. I say that cautiously. I mean, first of all, I think we collectively have learned at least two things. First is a, a call for equity is no longer a call for charity. I mean, we've all learned that I mean, the mantra that has been repeated over and over again, that nobody's safe until everybody's safe, that emphasizes that in order for us to uh, be well together, equity is necessity, not charity. And I think that's, that's a powerful incentive for us to collaborate. And indeed, and I think that has triggered many collaborations. And I see that in Korea uh, right now, and it's hugely exciting. So yes, in that sense, COVID has provided a trigger for a potential change. What do I envision post-COVID? Oh, geez, that seems just much too premature to speculate right now with uh, the situation evolving so much. What I would hope to see more is um, collaborations, uh, but perhaps uh, at this point was brought up by uh, a fellow panelist, more grounded in at the regional level first, because there are trade-offs for potentially prioritizing the global level governance, global level control, global level leadership. Um, so I would like us to be uh, careful uh, not to lose sight of those trade-offs. I think it's extremely important to be firmly rooted in the local context and what should be um, contributed by the national government at the national level, but also at the regional level and the global level, and how do we strike that balance so that it doesn't just tilt towards so much towards this top-down global um, coordination. Excellent, Jay. So I think the, the COVID-19 is definitely, the pandemic is definitely a trigger for, for change. I mean, it has, we've seen that it's definitely increased the awareness among uh, more different stakeholders, unusual stakeholders on the urgency of global health threats in the, in the world, uh, notably among investors. You know, um, people did understand that this pandemic has disrupted so many different components of, of lifestyles and, and, and investments in that sense. Um, I think it also has shown that inequitable access is not uh, is not an issue that we can live with for long anymore, and it has also exposed some of the chronic issues in access uh, for the whole world uh, in that sense. So it brings back the moment for uh, change among innovators to understand, okay, the design of products to make sure that they're more suitable for global populations in mind, the access planning, you know, uh, planning for registration, planning for supply chain sustainability, uh, ensuring that the accompanying uh, capacity needs and the use of existing platforms becomes more important. And I do think that it also has, um, has highlighted the, the, the urgency of getting away from some of these vertical systems where um, both country investments and um, uh, donor priorities uh, are all heavily uh, uh, centered around specific disease areas or specific uh, regions uh, where most of the work is being done. Um, a case in point is also in the area of medical oxygen. Uh, you know, many NGOs stepped up, many companies also said, okay, we can, we can help with the problem. 
Um, but everyone has their own fixed set of areas and, and expertise and a mandate that's been dictated by the way they were set up. So it gives you very little flexibility to expand existing systems or use the existing systems itself. Uh, but we've seen some good progress there. I mean, um, the pandemic disrupted the supply chain for a number of products, including a wide range of medicines. And uh, we found a number of companies, you know, BA, Bayer, GSK, Novo Nordis, Novartis, for example, they mobilized dedicated teams to provide that support and guidance to both local and global supply chain initiatives. And a lot of that uh, engagement and uh, solutions that they were that they were working on uh, were uh, because they had decades uh, long of investments in supply chain management uh, for malaria, diabetes, uh, and they used those networks in other fields to help the response to this pandemic. So that long history and be able, you know, that, that adaptability of the system to go from one thing to another at the same time, tailoring to, to, to the new needs, I think, uh, um, has shown, um, has shown a, a lot of promise there. Great, thanks. And Karen, maybe if I can uh, ask you to respond to this question and also to mention there is a, a comment and the question in the chats uh, about how after SARS and MERS, we saw public funding in coronavirus quickly evaporating. And so in a way, how do we <clears throat> that for the future post-COVID, we don't see the same yeah happening <laughs> yeah I, I i just read that and it's a very very interesting question uh, so in, in, in indeed you know and and um after uh after mers uh there was an imi project called zappi that was uh built actually it came from the the veterinary uh side of the industry uh, and this was uh, a platform for making uh, monoclonal antibodies and antigens in a, in a very fast track way with um, involving regulatory authorities very early on and so on and so forth. And luckily that platform uh, chose MERS as one of the, the targets. And out of that, because of COVID, a lot of the uh, you know, antigen uh, production systems and indeed some of the uh, multiple antibodies against COVID-19 have come directly from that, uh, that project. So the, the, there is some things that we can do, uh, but you know, the, um, uh, the, the question is, is there, uh, the, the, are government leaders willing to sustain this kind of investment in terms of um, uh, preparedness and, and response. So the European, uh, as I think uh, uh, Kevin already alluded to, the European uh, Union is, is creating this Health Emergency Response Authority, HERA, which, um, uh, which, which will be, I mean, we need to understand exactly how it's going to work and what its, its uh, remit is going to be and so on and so forth. But this should be uh, one very important element. And that needs, you know, several, several billions of dollars per year to, to do it. What, what we can do in IHI, and, and I think Julie already uh, called us an experimental platform, and it is exactly that. It's, it's, it can, we can experiment uh, in things at a certain scale, but not at a huge scale, but we can experiment uh, things on an IHI platform. Uh, in some of these uh, areas. Uh, and that's why we, we tend to work on these um, problematic areas just to test if a collaborative approach uh, would, would work and would accelerate uh, things. Um, and so, and, and the, the partnership aspect, I can't uh, stress enough how the partnership aspect is so key for us to be successful in this. So, you know, we've got some big uh, tuberculosis uh, projects uh, and, of course, involving the TB Alliance and uh, the Gates Foundation and, and other major, major players because you have to build these consortia joining up dots wherever those dots appear on the globe. And this, this, the last thing I ever wanted to do was to create an IMI or an IHI silo it, it, it's totally useless. So when we build these things, we have to join up these global dots and tackle these uh, big issues in a very uh, aligned way. So hopefully the EU leaders have understood 
uh, at least in, in part. And now it's, it's up to them, to the governments to come up with this hard cash uh, and, and hopefully um, be better prepared for the next uh, pandemic so that we, we don't get into this uh, mode of cat catastrophe response uh, that, uh, that has been unfortunately been the pattern. Excellent, thank you, Per. And, and Julie, yeah, I see you, you're uh, wanting to take the floor. And obviously, a big question for you is should these products, uh, you know, novel uh, vaccines, antibiotics, or diagnostics be, be provided as global public goods um, following COVID 19? Lots of discussions obviously on this topic. Yeah, and let me just follow up on, on Pierre's remarks because I, I think the world needs to step back and appreciate that what we've learned in the pandemic is that health security is national security, is global security, and we need to be thinking about how we protect health security with the same order of magnitude that we're willing to put into other aspects of our defense system and our in our global framework. This boomer bust has to stop, but I am fearful that um, we are rapidly losing momentum even as the pandemic continues to rage. But with respect to the vaccines and antimicrobials perspective, I think it's really worth um, thinking about the solutions that we've been experimenting with. For example, CEPI. Um, CEPI is a, a brilliant example to create a global good, which is a, a compendium of platform products and potentially diagnostics and immunotherapies um, that would be available if any of the 28 relevant families of, that, of viruses emerge and that those um, prototype products can be rapidly adapted to serve the needs of emerging pathogens. That's a concept right now, except he's a long way from being there, but I think that creates a global good of science and um, early product development that can then be um, taken to the next step with that we have to solve for is what's the global good of manufacturing and how do we assure a much better and smoother allocation and distribution and uptake system than we've currently demonstrated. Huge amount of work to do there, but I think it's also a case for the global health security agenda to be fully funded and for the innovative financing facility that's been proposed to be actualized and, and built out in support of uh, particularly the, the, the most um, needy countries um, who have the least resources and, and have, have had the big hardest time getting uh, vaccines and other countermeasures. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is uh, one example, CEPI, and then what needs to follow on to fully actualize the promise of those medicines of how to think about a global good. Um, there are other models. COVAX is something that's also been imperfect in the concept of, of the pandemic, but something we can learn from and improve. Uh, in the US, warp speed, unity of purpose, which allowed us to get a lot of things done fast, but you know, many lessons learned there too. So these are mechanisms that I think help provide the infrastructure for a global good in health security and emergency preparedness, but it's a long journey and we need sustained commitment. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin, I wonder your perspective and then, then we'll need to move to the very last question in which I will ask you only 30 seconds, but Kevin, I want your perspective on the COVID-19 learning. I remember a time not that long ago in which some infectious disease people would say to policymakers that, you know, they could imagine, uh, you know, a way of life being upended because of an infectious disease that broke out around the world. And, and, and I think a lot of policymakers, you know, thought of it as fanciful or just uh, fear mongering, right? After COVID, I think people accept that this is possible, right? So, so we have a more receptive ground. People see how civilization or a way of life is actually supported by um, having effective treatments for viruses and, and, and bacteria and everything else. Um, on some of the other points by the other panelists, uh, really interesting um, comments by everyone, I'll be quick. Um, think, of, um, think of things like CEPI as being, you know, being prepared, right? So that if, if some new virus emerges within 100 days, I think is their goal, they'll have something in the pipeline that can address it. Uh, you know, that, that's an investment. That's like having a fire truck ready, 
know, it, it, those trucks are not free and we pay for them in advance and people are trained and it's ready to respond. Uh, for bacteria, the world that I work in, bacterial evolution isn't quite as speedy and, and emergent in the same way as viruses. Uh, you know, there's, there's ways for us to be prepared too. And I've talked about Pasteur Act and really the price tag is about $4 per US citizen per year. It's about the same as, a, as an expensive Starbucks latte uh, to, to really prepare ourselves against the loss of antibiotics to prevent that. Well, what an amazing bargain that would be if we could do that. So I, I am very hopeful that we can invest in the right sort of solutions that are really economical and thoughtful uh, to prevent the sort of problems that we've seen these past two years um, from COVID. Great, thank you. That's a message of hope. Now we have really literally only four minutes to go. So if you could ask all of you just to perhaps, uh, you know, leave the audience with your final thoughts uh, or, you know, reflection, but only 30 seconds, please. almost like if you were to do a, a, a tweet. Um, I don't know where to start, maybe uh, on my screen from the right. Uh, Jay, do you want to get started? Sure, I, I think as, as a society, we, we've got used to, to inequality and inequity uh, too much. So, and it's a heavy reliance on, on a few players that really are carrying that heavy burden of, of, of uh, global health issues and, and trying to solve it. So I, I do think that if there's one thing we can, we can get from this discussion and, and uh, learn from the pandemic is uh, we have to build better systems and, and use pandemic as a springboard for that deeper sustained action and collaboration from multiple partners and bring that more diverse range of of uh, players, including more companies to step up, you know, more governments, so that we have better products in development, better access, and more sustained solutions. Fantastic, uh, Pierre. Uh, well, for me, it's just um, ensuring that we join up dots. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, we need to avoid any redundancies in the in the ecosystem and make sure that we're the most efficient we can in, in accelerating innovation when it's uh, when it's needed. So that's my join the dots uh, like that. Um, Julie, uh, I think the biggest lesson is that science is on our side. We have the scientific and technological capacity to really take this kind of threat off the table, including the AMR threat, as Kevin has pointed out. The question is, is society on our side? Um, we're, are we willing to make the investments? Are we really to, willing to do the hard work and build the infrastructure and the collaborations uh, over the long arc of time necessary to actualize that science in an equitable way? Excellent. Kevin? I think our problems are, are economic, uh, not scientific. The, the science is great. There's a lot of interesting you know, things being worked on. Um, there's actually a lot, of, a lot to be hopeful for if we can just find a way to correctly pay for it. Thank you, that's excellent. And Ahan? Yes, I would say to make sure that health R&D serves equity, not just innovation. Let's learn to collaborate with uh, a sense of allyship, I would say, rather than leadership. Uh, based on a sense of assumed uh, superiority. And let's learn to collaborate with a mind that's ready to challenge its own assumptions and norms about how to do things. I like that with very uh, positive notes from, uh, from all of you. We have uh, achieved a lot in terms of the science. Uh, let's continue addressing the collaborations. Let's con continue to uh, address uh, also like how we work uh, together, how we, uh, we ensure that the policies remain high on the agenda and how do we bring the right uh, incentives and economics into play. With that, well, thank you so much for this amazing uh, panel. Uh, there will be a, a reporting uh, back by David uh, Winnikoff, I think. Um, and with that, uh, I would like just to thank you all for, contrib for your contributions to all those who put the questions. Uh, apologize that we could not address all of them, but we, we tried. There was a very, very rich discussion going on in the chat as well. Thank you very much to all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Thank you.